We're going to go to Romans chapter 13. If you recall, just a fresh review, that way people can understand and keep it in mind when we continue this teaching. So charity means to give, right? To others. That's the idea. It's giving. It's about others. Within this spectrum of others, we have to keep in mind that God is prioritized number one, above others. So let me repeat that again. God is prioritized above others. Number two is others. Just because God is prioritized over others doesn't mean you get rid of others. So repeating again, just because God is prioritized over others doesn't mean you get rid of others. Quite often, the mistake is, like I told you before, this is what Bible believers are doing, okay? Now, that's a dangerous plane to be in because you're, you're pretending or you think that you're doing what God wants, but actually you're playing God, if that made any sense to you. So that's the most dangerous thing. I hate this the most, and that makes me really angry. So that's why I really call out false pastors or even uh, pastors within our own crowd who should know better. So I really don't like that. I really disrespect people who do that. You never do that. Because quite often when you do that, what you do is you control others. See that? Because you play the part of this is what God wants and then you do that as your power play to tell people what to do, to get mad at them or control them, manipulate them. I really, really, really hate that. Now, there is a false balance, remember, of what I warned about where people might agree with what I said earlier, but that makes them seek love from others. And that love from others is where they fail on this part, where God should be prioritized above others. In this place, you get people who have heresy or sin. As well as imperfections, if I want to put that in. The heretical extreme is to prioritize about others here. Let's see. And then here, the wrong part is loving God. But remember, that's not what these people are doing. These people, they're not loving God. What they're doing is they're playing God. They're being selfish. They're only thinking about themselves here, all right? So this is still you. It's selfish, all right? It's self. Uh, I should have put self, but anyway. Over here, you claim it's loving others, but to be honest, it's about you because you love the praise of men more than the praise of God. You don't like it when people accuse you of being unloving. It makes you look bad. Sometimes you have to have people hating you. If you can't stand that way, then there's something wrong with you. So let me repeat that again. Sometimes you need to get people mad at you, hate you. If you never have that in your life, you're going to be controlled by people. Okay? So I could care less if I name call, call it out, or be, you know, what people think plainly mean. If I call out scholars and false preachers. People get upset at me for doing that, but there's a reason why I do that, because they're doing these actions without something direct. And like I told you before, uh, the problem with this generation is it's become very effeminate. So they think that they have to win everybody by polite mode. Now, you can't play nice with everybody. Sometimes you have to understand, if you're not going to be direct, if you're not going to call them out, you're giving more liberty for the left-wingers, for the liberals, for those people, to keep being bold in directly calling out, getting mad, and calling you names. They do that. But we Christians can't do that, and we're called unloving? See, I, don't, I strongly disagree with that. So they become more direct, they become more fighting mode, and we lost our fighting mode. That's what happened, okay? Well, anyway, that's 
whole different story, okay? Point is, is that that's why there's uh, this extreme where we have to call them out. Over here, this is where they become extreme, where they call out people, and because of that, they fail to think about other people within their spiritual convictions. This is the same thing as imperfections as well. Not everyone is perfect like you, so you have to overlook it. Now, what's the balance to that is what I taught in beginner's discipleship. The be beginner's discipleship, it told you about the doctrine of judging others and fellowship and separation. You have to find your right team, okay? So, if you're in a Bible-believing crowd... That's your right team. And when you're in the right team here, this is where you get in the center. So then if you call them out right here, they got to be outside of your team. If uh, right over here, you have to uh, put up with others and then love them, we have to realize that all of this revolves around here, okay? Okay. All around here. Why do they go over here? They go over here because this is not sin heresy. Yes, imperfections, but imperfections is with people outside of our team or within our team. But we remember we give more favoritism here. Why is that? Because they're our family, they're our team. When they're outside of the team, you gotta find out who the enemy is. Now, that's the problem, is that people do not have enemies. And if you feel like that you have to be charitable with everybody, then you don't have an enemy. Okay? We do have enemies in this life. If you never have an enemy, then you're going to let those enemies keep abusing you. All right? That's why those left-wingers, they've now pushed us around, mess us around, and I'll be honest, they're more bold than us Christians. They're more bold than us. Credit to whom credit's due. But we lost our grit. We lost our fight. Christians cannot pass out tracts, but I see liberals passing out their gospel every single day. Liberals are bold enough to call out something if it's wrong, but Christians, we shut our mouths and keep silent. Okay? That's why we've been brainwashed by this loving other mentality that it made us just lose our fight, and now we're just victims or people who can be pushed around and bullied. All right? I strongly disagree with that. That's the reason why I am what I am today. If people accuse me of being mean, I'm sorry. All right? But I need to get rid of that conditioning, that false uh, conditioning brainwash mentality that you have and make you picture that Christians are not always nice and we can be pushed around. I'm glad I can break that stereotype thinking that you think of us. Now, if we understand our own crowd here, like I point out the arrow, right? That arrow should be pointed out to the right team, not in the wrong team here. If you move this over here, then you got a problem. You move this over here, what are you doing? What you're doing then is that you're tolerating the sin more and more. You're tolerating the heresy more and more. And some imperfections you could tolerate, but you're just tolerating other imperfections you shouldn't tolerate. So it becomes a very false balance. So remember I mentioned about you got to find your right team first. And that's Basic Doctrine 101 that I taught about fellowship separation as well as judging others. You have to do it over here, the right team, okay? Now, we understand more of the balanced spectrum. Let's examine this a bit more. And this is only concentrating the right team, okay? The Bible believers, how you should treat them. Because... With the Bible-believing crowd, let me add this part. They can go here. See that? 
If they go here, we can't keep dealing with them over here. We have to deal with them over here more and more. So it becomes something like, oh man, how much do I deal with them over here in this territory? Which is why this area is going to be the most concentrated upon, and we've learned that in our last charity class, okay? We have to realize everyone sins, they can hit here. But it's dangerous for us at times for us to judge them here because it's not really black and white, okay? Now, remember, that's the liberal mentality. Not everything's black and white, so you got to be loving with everybody. But see, it turned into a toleration that there's no enemy now. So we have to somehow stick over here while not compromising here. How do we do that? That's why it's called advanced discipleship today. So today, we're going to explore a little bit more in this advanced area. We're not talking about our enemies out there, okay? That one should be plainly black and white. But here, this is not black and white. We have to be more understanding, be more discerning, be more wise. You don't want to call out somebody by accident who is in the right. So that's the worst mistake you can ever do. But these people, we know it's plainly in the wrong because they're, they're in the wrong crowd, so it's easier to call them out that way. But within our own crowd, it ain't that easy. So how do we call them out? And also, how do we not call them out in a way where it ruins our testimony, but we're charitable in case we're wrong. So in Romans 13, the basis of loving is, we've seen right here, loving God, but also loving others. When, uh, did I say, uh, no, Romans 13, Romans 13. 1 Corinthians 13 is the basis, but Romans 13 is the first place where I mention if we look at Romans 13, look at verse 8. Verse 8, no, uh, Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. See that? So you will not break God's command if you love others. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. If you see that verse right there, loving others is important. It fulfills all of God's law. So, <clears throat> that's why these are so important. This guy's got to be out. Do you understand? If he's in there then it's hard to love others and love God the right way. And when we get into this territory, you can't really tell what to do. Okay? you got to get yourself out of the picture. The reason why people is so tolerating nowadays and so liberal nowadays is because it's really about themselves, not other people. Over here, the reason why people are mean-spirited and just ruin their testimony like jerks is because they're thinking about themselves. You disagree with me. So we have to get outside of these two wrong extremes by thinking about God and others and not you. If you simply question yourself, am I saying that way to the person? Am I treating the person in that way because it's in any way a benefit to me to protect my reputation, how I look? When you, when you do it in that way and critique yourself, you get outside of problems many, many times from committing the wrong actions, okay? Amen. So you always have to critique yourself. If you don't critique yourself and you just leave this guy alone, a lot of times this guy will go here or he will go here, okay? And he'll be in either extreme. When we deal with our brothers and sisters in Christ who are Bible believers like us. I've taught you about the gradual steps, right? So it's very important to take gradual steps when we try to expose something wrong, as I've taught you before. If we're, if we're dealing with people who are heading toward this territory, it's not as easy as to call them out that easily. So when we deal with those people who are entering this territory, 
Remember, you have to do things gradually. Exposure should be last in your mind, okay? It should be last. The first should be distance. If there's any way in the world that you could distance, this should be priority one, and this should be like priority 10 or 20 or basically last, okay? If there's any way possible you could avoid this part, you better avoid it at all costs. Now, I'm not talking about the enemy camp here. If exposure is the last thing on your mind, you're too tolerant and they'll take advantage of you. But when you're talking about your own family right here, this should be the last in your mind. If there's any way possible to get out of it, you should get out of it. But that don't mean you should condone them and be with them. You got to do whatever it takes to distance. You got to do whatever you can to distance from them, but uh, you got to do whatever you can to also make this the last thing in your mind. Quite often, remember that if they're heading toward here, you do these steps. But quite often the problem is you so you have to check yourself maybe what you're thinking as they're heading towards sin heresy or imperfection or imperfect is more you are the problem and 90 percent of the time in churches undoubtedly the problem is with you so you have to fix yourself like i told you before if you fix you then a lot of times you don't have to deal with this abstract area and get stressed if you fix yourself first, what's the problem with me? Why am I not loving toward that person? Why can't I get along with them? When you uh, interrogate yourself more, 90% of the time, you don't have to even deal with this teaching that I'm teaching you today. It will help you a lot where you don't have to make poor decisions in your life. So many people, they're getting stressed out and they don't know how to deal with a brother or a sister or a pastor in their church because they think that, well, they're the problem. They're the problem. So how do I deal with this? That way people don't misunderstand me. Hey, a lot of times the problem is you. <laughs> and if you fixed yourself, then uh, you don't have to deal with that stressful thing. But these cases do happen where they are the problem and not you. It should be rare, however, like I taught you last time. That should be very rare, and it will happen, unfortunately, because others are not perfect like you. So even if you fix yourself and you fix everything about yourself, that doesn't guarantee the other is going to fix everything. So if it's to a point where you cannot love, where you cannot put up with them because it will cause you to sin, you have to start distancing. And then the exposure should be last in your mind. Scandal going on in the church, then obviously, right, that has to be exposed. But if there's any way where you can be able to distance from a problem and the last thing is exposure, I would strongly recommend that. But there are those rare cases, like I told you, rare, rare, where a person's right here and it's very plain and it should be exposed. Okay. We understand these scenarios, and one of the best tips that will help you in this abstract area is to think about the consequences. Consequences. In other words, whether you expose them or you put up with them, you have to ask yourself, what's the consequences that's going to come out after that? In here, you're supposed to... Uh, love, okay? And then in here, you're supposed to distance. And then we're trying to work that out. We're trying to separate, but we're trying to get together. And then we, we got to deal with this abstract scenario. How am I going to deal with it? How am I going to deal with it? And then one of the most helpful tips, I've given you a few last time, but one of the other areas, I'll leave this here, that way we can all stay in the same mind, is to think about consequences. You know what's proof that you are thinking about yourself? I'll give you easy proof right here. 
Easy proof you are thinking about yourself is you are not thinking about the consequences. So let's say that there's a person that you should separate from in the Bible-believing movement. You shouldn't be buddy-buddy. You shouldn't love them, okay? You got to distance yourself because there is something wrong that is hurting your spiritual conviction with you and the Lord, and you have to distance, and uh, you have to separate. You can't be together with them. I've told you there are some cases like that where there is... I hate to say this, all right, and people will disagree with me, but it's going to be true because it happened to those Bible believers, I know it. But there is a Bible-believing pastor and a Bible-believing church that you have to separate from. I've taught you that. There's going to be those very rare cases. How, I, how do I know that? Because I add them in our directory. Okay? And then I get phone calls. I get emails. I even get warnings from pastors out there and evangelists not from yours truly from actually pastors and people out there evangelists who warn me about that bible believing pastor they tell me there's a scandal going on they tell me there's an abuse of power over there or stuff like that so i don't have a good conscience putting their church in our directory okay otherwise i'm just hurting people out there who are trying to find a good church now, in our directory, we're not perfect because I don't keep track of everybody there. All right? I don't know everybody there. But I'm doing the best that I can. That way people can find a Bible-believing church to go to. Because I'm a strong believer that you got to attend a Bible-believing church with a Bible-believing pastor, imperfect though they are. Amen. See that? So that's why I try to do more of that. But then at the same time, I don't have a clean conscience that if there's a really abusive pastor over there or a corrupt one, that I, have, that I can easily put them in the directory easier either. See that? I'm struggling with this balance here. This is why this is an advanced teaching. I'm trying to teach you how this works. So you have to think about consequences. You notice from that example about me, if I can put them in the directory or not. I have to think about the consequences, what's going to happen. When I think about consequences, did you notice that right here? Notice that is charity. Well, I'm thinking about others. See that? You have to think about the consequences. When you call out that person, are you doing more harm than good to the Bible-believing movement? To Bible believers, even to the person who will go to that church, are you doing more harm than good? See, you have to think about the consequences. That will help you a lot more if you want to expose them, separate them, call them out, or whatever. Another thing you have to understand is when you hang around with them, when you do love them, when these Bible believers you should separate from, think about the consequences, see? That's why there are churches that I have to cross out of our directory. Why? I'm thinking about others. See? Oh, you're unloving. They're a Bible believer like you. No, I am loving. That's why I didn't put that church in the directory. Why? Because I don't want people to go there and get messed up, and I'm responsible for that. And people, they get hurt. They suffer abuse from that pastor. Or they got their daughters where, God forbid, I'm responsible for sending them to a wolf in there that's going to take advantage of their daughter. See, I, look, Bible believers aren't pure. All right, because everyone's a sinner. Right. So I do have a conscience. So because of that, I love and care about others. I ain't going to put that in the directory. KJV 1611, only dispensational you are. I could care less. Amen. So you have to think about consequences. Think about others. Now here's another example. Let me get to a more difficult area. There are uh, Bible-believing pastors, like I told you before from the previous example, that I am not close with, and they are not close with me, and we both know it. Some of them don't know it, and I don't even know some of those pastors who aren't close with me either, but they are out there. Why is that? The reason why we do that is because there's something about that other Bible-believing pastor that we strongly disagree with, and we know that if we force ourselves to love each other, become very close, we might contaminate the people in our ministry. 
or there's something personal about that pastor we know that's very wrong that we don't trust in, and we don't want to get close or fellowship with that pastor, otherwise they might contaminate our testimony or our own people. Now notice that separation, that distance, is an example of thinking of others, consequences. Because you don't want your people to think, oh, that pastor's okay, so why don't we go to that pastor or fellowship with that pastor and pastor's church? No, then we're going to be responsible for messing up our own members down the road. So you have to think about others. I select preachers here for a reason, okay? I don't have everyone have a free-for-all on my pulpit, even if they are Bible believers. And guess what? Other preachers out there are doing the same thing with me too. Not every one of them trust me. Why? I don't blame them. I'm online, okay? And when they click me online, I'm next to kooks. I'm next to kooks. And what makes me mad about those kooks is that they, they're doing the same thing like I'm doing, and they're trying to do that because they want to think that we're all in the same plane. No, they're not on my team. But unfortunately, that's the case, all right? So those pastors and those churches who wouldn't invite me to preach in their churches, I don't blame them either. You know why? They're thinking about their sheep. Okay? They think that maybe I'm some online kook like other online kooks out there. I don't blame them. It really hurts me, but I don't blame them because I do the same thing too. See? Why? Because we're thinking about others here. We're thinking about others. Here's another thing. I don't really get mad at them either. Why is that? Because I'm thinking about others. I'm not thinking about myself. Yeah. Oh, you didn't invite me to preach. I'm hurt then see, that's about me, not them. So I have to think about others. What is the best for us Bible believers as a whole? We all mind our own businesses. Everyone's at peace. See that? <laughs> that's the mature thing that majority or nearly every pastor is doing, is everyone just minding their own businesses because we're all thinking about others here. We have to think about consequences. No, I cannot go to a revival meeting or a conference meeting where I can freely fellowship with everybody in there, even if they're all Bible believers. There are just some that I'm like, and some of those people are with me too. <laughs> why? Because it's life, and you're going to hit that. That's why I'm teaching that. <clears throat> Think about consequences. You have to think about others. I'm now going to talk about this other area a problem and a hindrance. Now we're going to come to problems and hindrances here. So if you think about consequences, think, then you're thinking about others, and then you won't do much damage. But I'll tell you one thing is that these so-and-sos who should know better, and I don't care how much Bible they know, these so-and-sos out there who just rashly and immaturely call out other Bible-believing preachers, what they've done now is that they've damaged other Bible believers, got them in the middle of a confusion, and those Bible believers, now they're treating those people that the Bible believer called out as enemies. And what they've done is they damaged the Bible believing community. And you have to think about the consequences. When you got five churches and these pastors calling out each other and all these Bible believers are all friends with each other, what are you doing? Not a fun thing. Some of these preachers ought to know better. And <laughs> it's just amazing to me how immature they are. And the stuff they say on the pulpit, they don't realize what they do for life and how many members they damaged and hurt. Maybe they all should get online with everybody paying attention to them so they can be more careful with how they speak. That will be good practice for them. <laughs> now, that's such a controversial thing to say, all right? So maybe I shouldn't have said that. But my point is, but my point is that... Because of that accountability, when you think like that, you're more careful with what you say. Yeah. But some people, they think they could say whatever they want on their pulpit. Now, online has its problem, but I'll tell you one good thing it did with me, all right? 
and make me more careful with my mouth. Amen. And I'll tell you one thing, I still make mistakes and I got a big mouth. But that thing was good for me. Because <laughs> why? I can't take back what I say. It helped me a lot with the stupid stuff that I say that I'll apologize for. it. It helped me a lot with even calling out people that I'm more firm in my belief on that one. And I'm able to explain that to people. See what I mean? What, does, what did that thing make me do, that camera online? It made me really think about others. Amen. A lot of people don't think about that. You think that pulpit is free for, all, free for all? Let me get on Bible believers right here. When you get up there, everybody is forced to listen to you because they think you're filled with the Holy Spirit power of God. That ain't a toy. Right. That's right. Just because you're not online, that don't mean that you lost authority of people listening to you. People still listen to you. They're going to listen to you, what you see on that pulpit. And it don't stay on the pulpit either. It goes outside and will carry on for life. You have to be careful on what you say up there. That's why I, that I really get upset at our Bible-believing crowd. Because they know so much doctrine and they think that they can call it out as it is. And what you've done is you permanently damaged, hey, not yourself. Oh, me, woe is me. Why do people hate me? Why do people think I'm controversial? Get off of that Saul mentality. What about your sheep, your people that you've hurt and damaged? Yeah, that's right. And they, you caused them so much confusion. You know what that is? That's a, like any liberal playing a victim. All about me. Woe is me. And then woe, 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 woe is me after the people you've hurt. What is that? That's a twist in mind. Okay. So you have to think about others here. And then the consequences that you've caused. Next thing is when you teach new doctrine. Now, you know what new doctrine will do? It'll either unite or it'll divide. A lot of people take this very lightly. Okay, there are Bible believers out there who have produced a lot of great new doctrines. And it's very interesting. Quite often, I would even borrow them. I'm not the one who made them up. It's those people. And then I would basically say, this is not from me, this is from them. Quite often I'll do that. I won't mention names because I just don't want them to get ashamed or embarrassed, okay? Especially with uh, my online persona, right? <laughs> so I try to think about them. I try to think about others out there. But anyway, besides that point, this is a problem with us Bible believers. Now get ready for this, okay? There are Bible-believing preachers and teachers that are giving new doctrine, but this new doctrine is causing more division than unity now I know what's in Bible believers mind truth is truth I get that truth is truth but you have to keep in mind this the reason why we give right doctrine is because we're thinking about unity the reason why we're against wrong doctrine is because it destroys our unity now, a lot of people don't read Romans 16 or the book of Ephesians. That verse points out to we're all perfect. We become one together. And that's why we attack wrong doctrine out there. All right, now think about this. If you give a new doctrine, and this brother and sister in Christ uh, disagrees with the new doctrine that you give, and this new doctrine, look at this. The point of new doctrine, what I noticed about Bible believers, get this now, listen, when they give new doctrine, it criticizes or corrects the doctrine that Bible believers are used to. That's one thing I noticed. I would like to give you a little eye-opening thing, all right? When I, I give a lot of new doctrines to the point of wild theories. Did you ever notice that I would give that doctrine as a deliberate correction of other Bible believers? 
If you think so, I would like for you to talk to me about that, all right? Because I would like to fix that, all right? Don't get me wrong. Sometimes it might happen, all right? It might have to correct other Bible believers out there, okay? But did you notice how I would always introduce a new doctrine as something that will unite Bible believers out there? That other Bible believers are prying into this doctrine, and this doctrine will help them out with that. You notice the power of unification through a new doctrine. Yeah. If Bible believers read the Bible much as you, study the Bible as much as you, believe that every word in that Bible is true like you, and they have the same spirit of truth like you, why should there be more division when there should be unity? Unless you think you're better. Unless you think you're smarter. Unless you think God revealed to you something special that he didn't give to other people. Ah, then what's that? You again. Don't get me wrong, sometimes it happens where God might give you some new doctrine and it might have to correct the previous doctrines that Bible believers have known about. I mean, there's that humility thing again. But that should be extremely rare, especially if they read the Bible as much as you, have a relationship with God much more than you, unless you're relying more on your smarts and knowledge. Then I'm scared. Then you're relying more on your brain power more than God giving you the new doctrine. I don't know if that was deep or over your head, but a lot of times people who give new doctrine, the reason why they'll correct or criticize other people is because they think they know more than the other people. Then my question is, why do you think you know more than other people? Is it because God showed it to you more than the other person? I hesitate on that when both of you have a strong spiritual walk with God then the only way God gave it uniquely to you rather than the other person is only because you're smarter than them. You saw something in the Bible that they didn't see. Why didn't they see it? And only you saw it. Because maybe you're smarter than them on something. And you saw something in the Word there. See, that's what makes me very hesitant. When you give new doctrine, you shouldn't criticize correct previous doctrine. You should uni unify it more. A lot of times, if... Uh, I have to correct previous doctrines from other Bible believers. Did you notice how I will always say it's a theory? Mm -hmm. Or it's just my opinion? Why would I often do that? Because I don't profess to know more than the other people. What's that? That's thinking about others. Thinking about other Bible believers. Because I believe, no matter how smart I am, and I can pull up my credentials and everything that I got, and some Bible-believing preachers know there about uh, the secret knowledge stuff that I have that I didn't say publicly online. But the important thing is I can pull that card too and try to point out and do a debate and try to win other Bible believers that my doctrine is better than them. You don't think I can't do that? Especially the background that I came from? Oh, I can sure do that. I can punch holes if I wanted to. But I don't make time to do that as much as they would. I'm careful when I do that. I don't do as freely as they would. Why? Because you're a coward. You should stand for truth. No, because I know how to handle truth better than you, maybe. So you have to be careful. Some Bible-believing preachers out there, whether they do it online, online or they don't do it online, they're just so sloppy when they introduce new doctrine, and it just causes a huge division out there. They don't think about the consequences. Maybe it would have been better if they just said, this is my opinion. Yeah. Then maybe it would have simmered down more yeah. if Bible believers chose to believe in a different doctrine that differ differentiates from you. Maybe it would have been better if you just said, you know, this is a theory. But if you said that if you believe it's right doctrine, then say to you, this is to me. To me, this is right doctrine. To you, may not be yet, and I'm open to being wrong. If maybe you gave that disclaimer, it would have been different. Yeah. Or maybe if you study this new doctrine, rather than just sh spilling the beans, trying to show this new doctrine where, wow, you know, great, you know, you're the next Dr. Ruckman. Oh, wow, it's so awesome. I never saw that before. Bible-believing preachers and teachers are teaching this wrong then, and then they all correct their pastors at home? Oh, see, you know, not a good testimony, is it? Yeah, not a good testimony. <laughs> a lot of people watch me online. 
I wonder what I say or teach and preach, they're going to correct their pastors on. See that? Careful what you say. You're just fortunate you're not online, perhaps. But whether you're online or not, both parties have zero excuse that what they say on the pulpit, they have to realize the consequences of what's going to happen from other people when they take that. So when you give new doctrine, the point is don't just spill the beans. You're not being careful then. You have to think about if I were to give a new doctrine, say something that's personally to me and of other people disagree, that's fine. If I gave that disclaimer, that probably would have been better. If I were to say it's a theory, that probably would have been better. If I basically believe it's a right doctrine, maybe it would have been better if I focused more on how can this right doctrine make other Bible believers agree and unify together better in their own studies, in their own walks with God. If you give a doctrine like that, do you realize how powerful that would be? That would be something that you want people to respect you, look up to you too. Huh. Uh, most uh, inconsiderate people are those online, obviously, and then they just uh, give out their teachings and then they teach that as right doctrine and then they have the audacity to keep saying, Dr. Upman is wrong about this. He's a good man. God used him. He gave a lot of right doctrine, but he's wrong on this. And when they keep doing that and then they call out other Bible-believing preachers, <laughs> Dr. So-and-so is wrong. Pastor So-and-so is wrong on this one. They're just so ignorant of the Bible and stuff like that. <laughs> These uh, online losers who never pastored people, never pastored a ministry, and they're just such losers that if they get the pressure on they don't have a pastor or a church, then they start their own little house church or something because that's all they can build up with their followers because they never thought about people to begin with, how to pastor people. They always thought about themselves. See that? It disgusts me. It disgusts me. I don't like that. So people online just freely post stuff in comments, freely post that kind of stuff. You make me sick, and you ruin the testimony. You ruin the testimony of Bible believers. And then, here's something. There are hypocrites out there who will call out those online losers, but they say stuff on their pulpit. <laughs> You know what they don't think about? They know that online, it spreads around the world, but they don't think that from their pulpit, it may not accidentally spread around the world. You may not be posting comments on YouTube or on Facebook, but you sure are putting up blogs on that pulpit. Some of you are, you know, you just uh, write a bunch of newsletters or mailing letters or even tell people in the church and when you do that, it has a cost to pay. And that may not be a posted blog or a posted comment, but that's as much as a posted blog and a posted comment when you did that. Why do you think God condemns gossip? Do you think when the Bible condemned gossip that he was thinking only online? You know what that was? To people. Hey, I know problems with our Bible-believing crowd and churches and pastors, but guess what? I ain't telling you. I ain't telling you. If it's something that has to relate to our church, then I would say it to the church, and I would mention that it's got to be kept within the church at times. And if people want to find out, I only give very little information as possible. Why? That's thinking about others, charity. I don't, I'm thinking about what will hurt our Bible-believing crowd. So I don't, I don't freely say all that on the pulpit or online. So should every pastor and Bible believer. Amen. So we think about consequences. We think about the new doctrines that we give out. Is it dividing or uniting? You better be careful of that. Can't just keep publishing books and articles and say stuff online and post comments. Oh, that's real bad with you Bible believers now. Now you're posting comments. That's as much as publishing books and articles because it's worldwide. You can't take back. Got to be careful with this new doctrine stuff, all right? Very, very careful. I got smart guys in this church, you know that? I got really smart guys. They give me a lot of good stuff. 
But guess what? We have our secret Reddit page. <laughs> it's just probably four or five phone numbers in here. And they make sure that I'm in there too. <laughs> we don't post that for all the church to see. And you're like, oh, I want to see it. No, sorry. <laughs> Not with our guys, all right? They're a little, they're a little this. They know so much doctrine. It's just a little crazy. So I have to keep them in line there. <laughs> all right, then. You probably could probably guess, but I ain't going to tell you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Thinking about others. And guess what? Those guys, they don't just spill the beans to everybody here either. Why? They're thinking about others. And by the way, they're humble enough to realize that we're a little... And me, I recognize I'm a little... <laughs> even if I don't think I am, people who watch me online already think I'm like this. So it'll help to keep me humble, I guess. <laughs> Somebody's got to think Gene Kim's a little this. Why? If no one thinks that way, then I probably will think that I'm sane and I'm all right, and it'll give me more freedom to say whatever I want to say. All right. Uh, let's see right here. Wow, time flies. I'm spending this. <laughs> if I can squeeze all this, then let me add this. You know what's a very good thing to think about concerning consequences? Well, help a lot with consequences is that um, in the Bible, Paul says that I'm the, children, uh, I'm the father that birthed you children. They also mention that they're a shepherd taking care of sheep. Now, you know what that means? You have a parent role if you're a pastor. Now, if you think that way, and uh, maybe you're not a pastor, you might say. Well, you Bible believers are just as guilty because you, you act like you're a father figure <laughs> when you call out different Bible believers, criticize them, or teach people what to do. <laughs> but anyway, even if you're not a father role, you're part of the family role. If you're in a family role, let me give you one eye-opening thing here, all right? If, if thinking about consequences really helps you, then what will also help you is to think about when uh, family members fight each other. Now, when family members fight each other, especially when there's a divorce, and Bible believers, they do divorce from each other, even though they're in the same body of Christ. They separate from each other. Here's a question for you. Who suffers in the divorce? Is it the two parties that fight with each other? Who suffers more? I got the answer there. You don't need, it's, it ain't rocket science. You don't need physics for this. Kids. Yeah. Who are the kids in the ministry? I'm not talking about just little kids. You know who the kids are in the ministry. These are the members that you have in your church if you're a pastor. Yeah. These are people who watch you online, and even though they don't think you're a pastor, you're an authoritative figure to them. That's why I get really mad at online people. They say a bunch of garbage out there. And I'm glad they got smaller subscribers than me. And if some of them have bigger subscribers than me, I actually feel sorry for them. Because now they just spread a rotten testimony already. You can't say stupid stuff online. But here's another thing, all right? It's not just online. God was not thinking about only online. He was thinking about people who don't have online too. And there are these people who say stupid stuff and you don't realize who you've hurt in a divorce. When two Bible-believing parties are fighting each other, what happens? Do you pick teams then and have kids turn against their parents? You have to think about that now. Divorces are ugly and heartbreaking. And, you know... One party is truly guilty, don't get me wrong. Maybe one is a manipulative mother or an abusing father. But I'll tell you one thing, this should be very rare. You know normally in divorces, it ain't like that. Normally, it's two parents at fault. One could be more guilty than the other. One could be in the more wrong than the other. But within those divorces, kids don't play sides. They're usually caught in the middle. And then the problem is... With parents, they don't think about their kids. And they want their kid to pick a side. Come on, brother. 
You know what that is? That is selfishness. You want the love of that child. You want that child to love you and then hate the other one. You're not thinking about your child. They lost a mother. Do you understand that? They lost a father. Do you understand that? And by the way, it may not have to be at a point where they have to really totally separate from their father or mother. They could probably still enjoy the father's love or the mother's love if they got divorced, if their other parent got divorced. That's why, what's normal in courtrooms? What's normal in courtrooms during custody cases is that parents have some kind of equality in taking care of the kids. Whether one has more of the time to spend with a kid than the other, the point is, is that normally in divorce cases, the judges, they see both sides. It's pretty rare concerning about uh, manipulative or abusive parents. Now, those things happen, don't get me wrong, but normally, generally, with 50% of divorces in America, it ain't run like that. Both, usually both parents have custody of the kids, whether one has more time than the other. What's my point in saying all that? If that's what it's like with physical families, you better believe that's the same with your spiritual family. And then what you're doing, what you're saying to the children, it causes them permanent damage. And when I say children, I'm talking about people who listen to you, who learn Bible from you, who think of you as some authoritative statement and figure. Be careful what you say on the pulpit or online or what you write for when you publish a book or publish an article or what you say to your people who are friends and family members with other people. Yeah. Who suffers? Not you. Yeah. The children. You know one thing that disgusts me more about you people who go through your divorce? You always put a pity party on yourself and how, you know, how you're hurt and then how the children are against you, and then the one that you're fighting against is against you, and that makes me really sick to my stomach because it shows me more of a selfish mentality that you have rather than your children. Do you know how many people have hurt me and I really would like to say something wrong about them, but you know what keeps my mouth shut? Because I'm thinking about my Bible-believing family as a whole. It's going to hurt them more than it hurts me. You have to be careful of that. A lot of people, they think that this even comes down to a point, let's say there are brothers and sisters in Christ not getting along in a Bible-believing church. A lot of times the problem is with you, but if you were to think about this, this might help you a lot more too. Who are you going to hurt? Not worth it. Uh, another problem that Bible-believing churches have that I notice, it's a you mentality, right? You notice that? Everything is about you, you, me, 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 right? Me, 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 me. That's why they don't know how to balance charity. Always me is in the picture in all of this. You notice that, right? With, even with an ugly divorce, yes, you can be even wronged against. But see, it's very easy to think about me here and not them who get hurt. It's still a me mentality, and you got to repent of that, and you got to fix that. And stop pulling up a pity party thing and trying to get people onto your side. Uh, one thing I notice about people who lack charity, and then there's so much division going on within the Bible-believing body, is that they're always thinking about themselves. They're kingdom builders. Now, that's quite a strong accusation, but let me repeat this, okay? Kingdom builders tend to not balance correctly, okay, in, in the doctrine of charity. They're either too loving, remember that one extreme, getting along with everybody, and then they're just too mean, all right, they just call out everybody. If you're a kingdom builder, you'll fall into either extreme, guarantee. Why? A kingdom building mentality is a pastor or a Bible believer who thinks that, who is stuck in their own mindset. When they're stuck in their own mindset, let's get to the too loving person. The too loving person is, whether he has an online channel or a ministry that he's running or a church that he's pastoring, okay? 
whatever, or some kind of ministry that they're running. When they're too loving, the reason why they're doing that is because it benefits their ministry, their channel. They want to get more followers, subscribers, uh, students signing in for classes, members to keep coming to their church. They hold a conference meeting, and then they can have a lot of churches and pastors. See, it builds up their own kingdom. Why? It makes their ministry look good, their name look good. That's why they want to have all these meetings when they travel. See that? It makes them look famous. That's why they're too loving with people. Kingdom builders, why are they too mean? They're too mean because it disagrees. It doesn't go along with their kingdom system that they planted in their ministry. And if any Bible believer runs a ministry different from you, then see that? That's against your kingdom. And what kingdoms have done throughout history is that they brutally stamped down other kingdoms and forcibly made those other kingdoms follow along their kingdom system. They're a kingdom builder. Huh, you ain't, you never done crusades? You never did jihads? I never seen so many Bible believers doing spiritual jihads and spiritual crusades all my life. They're kingdom builders. Why? Me, me, my kingdom, my kingdom, my, my. God's using only your kingdom. You're funny, man. You're funny. You, uh, there are plenty of Bible-believing pastors, plenty of Bible believers out there. Yes, even commoners out there who are better people than me, who have a spirit close spiritual walk with God, who know more doctrine than I do. I'm just spoiled and blessed that God has given me the fruits that I got today when I don't deserve a single bit one of them. There are plenty of better people out there, and I don't dare to think that when I build my kingdom that everybody's got to follow along like I do, that I'm better than them. And I won't be such a weak person to be in this extreme either in getting along with everybody so I can make a name for myself. I could care less about that because it's not about me. It's about God's kingdom here. Amen. I'm thinking about His kingdom. And I'm not talking about physical kingdom, His spiritual kingdom. Amen. What benefits Bible believers as a whole? What would help them? You know another thing about this kingdom building mentality? Let me give you an eye-opening thing right here. This kingdom building mentality, they're not thinking about their real enemies that they got to attack. And because they're not thinking about their real enemies out there, what they're doing is they're small fry, cheap, weak people. Because all they're doing is they're thinking about my own little kingdom that I'm building. They're just like capitalists. They're just like any other weak, pathetic king where they're thinking about a small picture of my own ministry, my own kingdom. I'm content with that. What about the whole world out there? There's a bigger, there's a lot of Goliaths and enemies out there. But no, you can't fight against them because you're just too weak. But these other Bible believers, they're small fry, and you can take advantage of them. So you call them out, and then these other people, you don't spend time attacking the real enemy. A bunch of cowards. That's why they all go you know, to a Bible-believing community and area, and then they all fight against each other. You know why? That's pathetic small kingdom building. And they're all trying to get, control people around their terrain. I know how mega pastors run and start their ministries. You know how you do that? You pick on the small fry, easy areas. Then by doing that, you build up more and more and more. My case, I just went uh, in, of all places in the Bay Area to pastor. Out of all cases, calling out everybody wrong online and in, in the scholarly community. Why do I do that? They're my real enemy, not my own crowd. And if I spend time trying to build up my own little kingdom and stomp them out and bully them, I'm just as weak and, and pathetic. You know what makes a strong pastor, a strong Bible believer? You attack the real enemy, not your own family yeah, that's right. and controlling them. What makes you different from an abusive father then? You know why they're doing that? Because they're weak and pathetic. Because they can only uh, beat up their wife and then beat up their kids because that's all the power that they've got. I don't like this, this 
Bible believers get on kingdom builders and they don't realize they're kingdom builders. The most eye-opening thing, you know how to get out of my? You go to others. You know how you do others? You go out there. What helped me immensely is that I travel. And that opened my eyes to a lot of things. Helped me think about others. Even before my traveling days, you know what helped me think about others? Is that I don't think I'm right, and I think that others out there could be right or have something better or something that I'm missing. As long as I had that, that helped me. The point is, is that I'm not, you know, we emphasize the local church. Amen. The local church is important. But you know what? That don't mean that you're a Baptist brider and that's the only church. We forgot the universal church. You know why you became a kingdom builder? You only think local. Local church, local church. Well, how about you, what about universal? You know how you get outside of the my kingdom territory? You get universal here. Go to other Bible-believing churches, other Bible-believing ministers, how they run the ministries, how the Holy Spirit used them, and then see how God mightily used them out there rather than you thinking that everybody's got to run the ministry like you did. That's the most dangerous place to be in. You got to go out there and you got to see what they've done. Even myself, I called out some pastors that even Bible believers go, oh, Brother Kim, that's a little bit too mean, all right? So I call them out too, don't get me wrong, all right? So I call it out as it is, even with pastors that Bible believers are kind of going, ooh, but I am not stuck in my own little world here either. When I travel or when I have that mentality, there are others out there who have something more than I do that helps me keep in a balanced plane there. It helps me not to think that everybody should teach and preach and run the ministry like I do. If you do that, you're a very selfish so-and-so, okay? You got to get out there. One thing I noticed too, which is very helpful to me, I'm glad the Lord made me travel. Some people might think that um, I'm doing a little bit too much, and they're probably right, but that's between me and the Lord. I know this, the more that I travel, the more the Lord is showing me things. When he slows me down, he'll tell me to slow down. Amen. When he tells me to stop, he'll tell me to stop. Amen. But for now, I see God confirming it more and more. Why? It helped me pastor my own church better. Amen. It helped me see what's out there more. And guess what? Some of you can admit this. It helped you. But if I didn't travel out there or introduce you to these ministries, how would it help you being stuck in the Bay Area all alone? It helped you change a lot of your perspectives, your own things in life, didn't yeah. it? By getting out there. We need to get out there. That's why I stress so much about campaigns for Christ. Right. You really need to go. It, even if you don't want to pass out tracts, it's just good for you, That's to be right. honest. Amen. Even if uh, uh, for souls, I get that. But the reason why I go out there is more for me believe it or not. I do go out there for souls, don't get me wrong, but it's more so for me. Yeah. Why do I do that? It helps me change my perspectives. It helps me be more strong. It helps me not to be a whiner, a complainer, and then whine about everything where everybody doesn't follow along like I do things or feel sorry for me. Get out of here and do something for Christ. Amen. Okay? If there's a place to really be self-centered, it's the Bay Area. It's very easy to have a whining mentality. You need to get out and see what the Lord has done with the, those other places. By the way, what you say about other people, you can be wrong once you see how the Lord is using them. So you need to go out and spend time with them. And then what happens is this too mean side simmers down when you go out and see them. So see the others. See how the Lord's using them. Now, you have to be careful of the other extreme. The other extreme is the, this too loving side. Yes, that's the reason why I attend the conferences, the big revival meetings, because the Lord's blessing them on something that I don't have. And no, that becomes too loving because they fail to think about people that they see, but the people, get this now, don't be gullible, please. When you see others, they 
could put on a show. And then make their ministry, their revival meeting, and their preaching and teaching like, oh, that guy's a Bible believer. No, but if you walked into their everyday regular church meeting, they're deader than a doornail. You see their true colors when you walk inside a regular church service. That's why with our church, what I want people to walk into is that they walk into a regular church meeting. That way they can see how I pastor, they see how people that they are. They could be sneaky. They could be putting on a good show. They're hypocritical. They're sneaky. So how do you deal with this scenario? Loving others too much is a blind love. A blind love is like any parents who have a blind love with their children. See, that's not true love then. You think you're loving them, you're loving others. No, that's a blind love. You're spoiling them. You're encouraging them in their bad behavior of being sneaky. So what do you do? In order not to have a blind love, you keep an eye out. Like you do with your children, don't you? You don't just believe everything that the child says. You keep an eye out on the child. Especially, these are two additional factors, okay? That way you can uh, avoid blind love, okay? So how do, you, uh, how do you counter this? Where you go out and see others, but you don't want to be deceived by them. Okay, so to avoid blind love is as follows. One, there are other people that you love. And those others that you love, they agree like you. They're of the same mind as you. They, you trust them. If they see something wrong with that person, it's natural for any parent to keep an eye out on that person. Think about it. If three of your children told you what's wrong with your other child, what's going to happen? The parent's going to go, oh, you guys are wrong. That child's a good child. No, you're going to keep an eye on that child. So others you love and trust will show it to you. The second thing, which is very important, is you got to know their weaknesses. Now think about this. Let's use that same example again about that, uh, those three children you love and trust. They tell you what's wrong with that one kid. You can't easy, easily believe them either if you know their weaknesses. Maybe those three kept picking on that one child. Maybe they're used to bullying that one child. Maybe those three children, they love a power play and bullying people. Only true love, not blind love, true love will make you see the weaknesses. See that? True love makes you see the weaknesses in everybody, and then true love makes you know when others you love and trust will show you what's wrong about that person. Now, did that make any sense or no? Okay, that's a huge factor that will help you so that you don't make the mistake of seeing others too easily, okay? There are some people you should just avoid. Some people will tell me, well, Gene Kim, I know you called out this person online or uh, this pastor, but if you know them like I know them, if you met them like I met them, see how much they love the Lord, blah, 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 no thank you, I already know. Why? How do you know? You never met the person because there are others I love and trust who personally knew the person. Makes me cautious. But also, I keep in mind of all their weaknesses. If there's a person that they know online or in the church, but those people who tell me have their own weaknesses, I don't trust what they say. And I might just visit the guy that they accuse and see for myself. So anyway, uh, all of this will be very helpful to you, okay? If you have true love, you're not going to be gullible. All right, that's the lesson on charity. Hopefully you learn how to use charity now in the right way. We don't want to be too loving. There are people you have to separate in our Bible-believing crowd. And there are people that uh, you should love. You shouldn't separate. You should shut your mouth on within our Bible-believing crowd. All right. Heavenly Father, I pray today's teaching was a blessing to the hearers. Help us truly prove to this lost and dying world that we do have real charity. We should have more charity than the Catholic Church, than the liberals. Lord, I pray that Bible believers will take this seriously and prove it, Lord. Rather than proving the devil right, that we are too mean, we are too unloving, 
or that we are just gullible and blindly loving and everybody. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.